year was 1981, and I was going to get on this day what I had been waiting for a long time. You see, there was an album at that time that everyone in my middle school had. It was hot. It was a must get. And this was the day when I was finally going to get it. I'd saved up my money. I didn't even wait for mom and dad to find an opportune time to drive me. I got on the number four bus and rode it to Briarwood Mall. I marched straight to the record town, plunked my money down on the counter and put my hands on the crown jewel. Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> Diary of a Madman. Now this is not, uh, this was not the, the Ozzy that's known as the lovable, cuddly grandpa of reality TV, right? This is the early days, post Black Sabbath. A lot of rumors of crazy things on stage, satanic worship, whatever that means. And so he, I, I come home, though, nonetheless, with the album. And my mother, whom I did not even know, knew about Ozzy Osbourne, and who to this day, to this day, almost never gets outwardly, expressively angry, like went crazy. Gritted teeth, she said, I will not have our family's money supporting that man. And I had to get back on the bus right then, go back to Briarwood Mall, take it back in utter shame and embarrassment, lay it on the counter and exchange it for, in case anybody's interested, Aldo Nova. So there it was, right? Great shame and embarrassment taking this album back. But, but the worst part about that whole thing was, was the feeling of missing out. Right? Missing out on the conversations your friends are having at lunch, on the cool album artwork, uh, on all of the memorizing the words that everybody's able to do because they have the, the words printed on the inside jacket. And not all the songs are played on pop radio on the album. Right? It's a feeling of being excluded. Now, I understand that as this little story is a very middle-class problem, right? first-world problem, that there are people who miss out in ways that are really traumatic, and this was not that big of a problem. But this fear of missing out is a big deal. How many of you are familiar with the letters F-O-M-O -O put together? FOMO, some heads nodding yes. FOMO was first coined in 2004. It's, it's, it is legitimately recognized as a cause of social anxiety. It's the fear of missing out, F-O-M-O, -O, fear of missing out. It is attributed in some ways to the rise in, in social media. So why are we on our devices so much? Because we're afraid of missing out and all the stuff that's out there to be connected with. In fact, there was a study in, in the UK and the United States a couple years ago that found that over 50% of adults ages 18 to 34, so that millennial generation, 50%, 56% in fact, wanted to say yes to everything for a fear of missing out. It's legitimate, right? And it's not only legitimate and it's not new, it's, it's an ancient phenomenon because we see it in our scripture reading today. And I want to share the scripture uh, that comes to us from the Gospel of John 19 to 29 this way, but it introduces us to a man named Thomas, and he experiences missing out. So here's the Gospel of John, 9, chapter 20, 19 through 29. When it was evening that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And then Jesus said again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they will be forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they will be retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. <laughs> the other disciples <laughs> said to Thomas, we have seen the Lord. 
kind of sad. Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, unless I put my finger in the mark of the nails, unless I put my hand in his side, I, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were again gathered together, and and this time Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hands and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas said, my Lord, my God. And then Jesus said, have you believed because you've seen me? Well, blessed are those who've not seen and have yet have come to believe. The word of God for the people of God. This story has a name. It's called Doubting Thomas. It's meant to be a derogatory name. But really it ought to be called Missing Out Thomas because this story is about missing out. And the question that it leads to is, how do we come to faith while missing out? Right? I mean, Thomas missed out on Jesus' first appearance to the disciples. And you and I, 2,000 years later, we've all missed out on, on what the disciples experienced with Jesus. How do we come to faith? And, and you think about our own lives here today. Think about your life. I think about my life. We miss out all the time. We may miss out on getting all the information we want to have before we make a big decision. We may have to make that decision before we have all that information. We may miss out on the dreams that we had for our children because they went another direction. Or we may miss out on the healing that we've prayed that we'd receive. We may may miss out on time spent with Loved ones, because God's time is in our time and God has taken them before we're ready to let go. We may miss out all the time. The question is, how do we come to faith? How do we believe in the face of missing out? And again, I think we, we, can, we can learn something from Thomas. Because even though he does doubt and he's skeptical, at the end of the story, he believes. He comes to faith. And what's more, he wants to believe. He doesn't even need to actually touch Jesus' hands to to believe. He says, I've got to touch his hands, but he doesn't actually do that. He comes to faith simply by Jesus showing up through the locked door and saying, here I am, in a way that Thomas recognized and could connect with. And I think that same thing holds true today. We have, at our church, we have uh, two men's Bible study groups that meet during the week. And a couple weeks ago at both of our men's Bible studies, I asked the guys this question. We've all had loved ones who've died. As faithful people, we believe in the resurrection. I said to them, how do you believe? How do you believe in the resurrection when you haven't seen it? I mean, so far we're on this side of the resurrection. So we haven't experienced it firsthand. How do we believe? And the guys gave some great answers. But they were all some versions of, of what we saw with Thomas. One guy said, I believe in the resurrection because I see my loved one lived out in the legacy that they left, that lives on in the people that they touched and the places where they walked. Another said that they believed in the resurrection because they saw their loved one come back to them in a clear vision in the living room, assuring them that they were okay. Someone else said, "Uh, I believe in the resurrection because of an inexplicable sense of peace and calm that came upon me. I can't describe it. I can't explain it. But I just know it was God's favor and God's Holy Spirit coming to rest upon me. But you see, in all those ways, it's the, it's the same as Thomas. Christ broke through the, the doors surrounding us, whether that's grief or doubt or skepticism, and revealed himself in a way that said, I'm here. I'm here. And that's what generates faith. So we move to our communion table every Sunday because this may be another way that Christ reveals his presence in your life. It's why we invite everybody to receive communion because we don't believe that it's possible to put a a barrier up between Christ and his work that he wants to do in people's lives. That's why we invite everybody to join us for communion. But as we prepare for communion, 
We're going to sing hymn number 428. We're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 3 of that. Verses 1, 2, and 3. And as we do, I invite you to think about this or maybe carry this question with you on into the week. When in your life have you been doubtful or skeptical about something? And how did Christ break into your life? How did God provide you assurances that things were okay? That's something to hang on to as we go forward in our lives. And we continue to encounter those moments where we're missing out on all of the things that we might otherwise hope to have. Let's stand and sing verses 1, 2, and 3 of hymn number 428.